God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Anytime the clergy of a parish take the pulpit to talk about stewardship, to give a sermon on the amount, they risk intruding on an area of your lives that you hold as personal and private. For some, the church talking about money is a bit like the church talking about sex. Although in this day and age, it's probably easier to talk about the latter. <laughs> Either way, both subjects demand a certain bearing of the facts that most of us would just as soon avoid because it makes us feel uncomfortable. Which, by the way, reminds me of a story of the old South Carolina farmer who built a pond on the back 40 of his property for swimming and for fishing. One day, the old farmer decided to go down to the pond, and he hadn't been there for a while to look it over. As he neared the pond, he heard voices shouting and laughing. Drawing closer, he saw that it was a group of young women from the local women's college who were there skinny dipping in his pond. He made the women aware of his presence, and they all went to the far deep end of the pond. Finally, one of the women shouted to him, We're not coming out until you leave. The old farmer thought for a moment. Then suddenly he yelled back, Don't worry, I didn't come down here to watch you ladies swim. I just came down here to feed my alligators. <laughs> now, I'm not up here to feed the alligators this morning. And I don't want to make you feel uncomfortable. I simply want to share with you why it is that I gave my note of financial pledge to Christ Church. I want you to know how I came to this decision, and I hope that it may be helpful for you to know a little bit about my personal theology. Because you see, I've struggled with this issue just like many of you do, and perhaps my journey will strike a familiar chord or two. There are three simple reasons why I give my treasure and have made a significant annual pledge to the church. The first is because it's necessary for my spiritual health as a Christian person. You see, I was not born into this world a giving person. I didn't inherit a generosity gene or a chromosome that dictated a giving attitude. And while my parents taught me about giving to others, my nature was to be rather, well, self-centered. I was also born as an alpha male. I'm the oldest child of a middle-class family and the oldest grandchild of that same family. I was told, even subconsciously, that the world was mine to gain. All I had to do was go out and grab it for myself. In short, I was born a taker, not a giver. And all my life, I have struggled with a nature that is basically a self-centered one. For some reason, that defies my comprehension even to this day. For at some point in my early adult life, I learned a truth that a life defined by taking was going to be none other than a dead-end street for Sandy Key, a journey that ends only in death. I can assure you that that truth hasn't come easy, especially with my nature always telling me to believe otherwise. But God decided from some extraordinary reason, decided that I was to be one of his servants. God wanted me to live a life defined by the two greatest commandments that our gospel dictates. Love God, love your neighbor. And apparently there is one person who is even more hard-headed about getting his way than I am. And that's gone. And so God and I will continue to struggle. But what I have come to learn is that giving of my treasure to God is the only way that keeps my self-centered nature in check. I must give if I want to be a healthy person. It's like when you go to the doctor and the doctor says, take those antibiotics. The doctor doesn't say, it would be nice if you would take these antibiotics, or you might want to consider taking these pills. Rather, she says, if you want to get rid of the bacteria, then take these pills. 
Otherwise, you'll still be sick. She's not commanding me to do anything. She's just describing reality. I give because it keeps me healthy as a person, body, soul. The second reason I give to this church is because outside of my immediate family, the church is the community that I truly believe in. Now, this is not to say that the church is a perfect place. Like any human institution, it has its faults and its failings. And if someone wants to find a reason not to give, it's not going to be hard at all to find a reason. Our sin is often quite apparent. Interestingly enough, though, the New Testament has never suggested that the church is a perfect community. Historically, such thinking has come from Christians who like to think of themselves as perfect. And in this day and age, the media doesn't help that either. That's why the media has a field day when a church gets into trouble or when there's some moral controversy. Look at these people who think that they're perfect acting imperfectly. Now isn't that news? The New Testament, on the other hand, suffers from no such illusion. Of course the church is imperfect. What would you expect? It's full of sinners. As the church, we understand ourselves not to be a perfect community, but a redeemed community. And there is a big difference. Because I believe wholeheartedly in this redeemed community. I believe that the answer lies in being here with you and sharing in the discipleship of Jesus. And despite how clouded and convoluted things get by on trivial matters, I feel that I am a part of something holy and everlasting, that I'm home in the deepest spiritual sense. For the church will always be my home. Today we find ourselves living in a very, very dangerous world. There's no true safe place in this world. Nothing, no institution that can promise the safety of God's love and compassion. No government, no ideology, no principality or power that can offer that. It is only within the body of Christ that there is a promise of true sanctuary. Think about why so many people turned to the church on 9-11. Tell me why they did. Over the years, clergy have preached on and on about how terrible it is that some people can pay their club dues but can't seem to make a pledge to the church. It's a familiar diatribe, but let me ask you something a bit different. When the next 9-11 comes, or when there is some tragedy in your life, to whom and where will you turn? Will you make your way to your alma mater? Will you contact the local historical society? What community will you seek out? Does your giving reflect how you will respond at that moment? I'm not trying to invoke fear here. I'm simply trying to hold up a reality. And finally, I would like to explain that I give to the church because it's my way, our way of responding to God's generosity. This is probably the strongest reason. Now, that may sound like a token statement from the associate rector, but let me assure you, it's a claim that is deeply, deeply felt in my life. I won't get too personal this morning and tell you why that is, perhaps at another occasion. But I will tell you that at some point I had a conversion experience about my giving. At some point I came to realize, by the grace of God, just how plain fortunate I am in this life. I had spent a lot of my life before that worrying about what I, my family, didn't have. I lived out of a sense of scarcity about what I and my family didn't have. And you know what? I found scarcity. 
suddenly, through various experiences, God broke through my hard heartedness and woke me up to the abundance that I had around me and that I had been missing. It's amazing how one can forget about the generosity of God and simply not see it. A few years ago, I had the pleasure of listening to a sermon by an Episcopal priest during the installation of a new rector. At one point, the preacher looked out at the congregation and said something that moved me then and I will never forget. For he said, let me tell you something. If you give generously to this church, God will bless you. If you don't give generously to this church, God will still bless you. And if you're one of those who refuse to give generously, I hope God will bless you and bless you and keep on blessing you until you're so darned embarrassed that you can't help but respond. <laughs> I just love that. It is home as a message, and I think that's a wonderful theology. Well, those are the three reasons that I give a large portion of my income to Christ Church. They're not the only reasons one might have, nor are they the best reasons for giving. They're just mine. I know many of you take your giving very seriously and truly make it an expression of your relationship with God. I am amazed by the financial generosity I've seen in this place. It awes me. And as one of the leaders of this parish, I want to thank you for what you do. What I pray is that all of us this year will take our pledge seriously and know it for the spiritual opportunity that it is. Our God is so gracious and so intent on loving us and to being gracious people too, despite sometimes our hard-headedness and our hard Heartedness. May we write on our pledge card what may be written above all, be written with a humble heart, a deep sense of gratitude, and with the knowledge that we are loved beyond reason or measure by our Lord and by our God.